The Spleen, a Pindaric Poem, by Anne Finch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What art thou, Spleen, which everything dost ape? Thou Proteus to abused mankind, who never yet thy real cause could find, or fix thee to remain in one continued shape, still varying thy perplexing form, now a dead sea thou'lt represent, a calm of stupid discontent, then dashing on the rocks wilt rage into a storm, trembling sometimes thou dost appear, dissolved into a panic fear. On sleep intruding dost thy shadow spread, thy gloomy terrors round the silent bed, and crowd with boarding dreams the melancholy head. Or, when the midnight hour is told, and drooping lids thou still dost waking hold, thy fond delusions cheat the eyes, before them antic spectres dance, unusual fires their pointed heads advance, and airy phantoms rise. Such was the monstrous vision seen, when Brutus, now beneath his cares oppressed, and all Rome's fortunes rolling in his breast. Before Philippi's latest field, before his fate did to Octavius lead, was vanquished by the spleen. Falsely the mortal part we blame of our depressed and ponderous frame, which till the first degrading sin let thee its dull attendant in. Still, with the other did comply, nor clog the active soul, disposed to fly, and range the mansions of its native sky. Nor, whilst in its own heaven he dwelt, whilst man his paradise possessed, his fertile garden in the fragrant east, and all united odors smelt, no arms sweets until thy brain could shock the sense, or in the face a flushed unhandsome color place. Now the jonquil overcomes the feeble brain. We faint beneath the aromatic pain, till some offensive scent thy powers appease, and pleasure we resign for short and nauseous ease. In every one thou dost possess, new are thy motions and thy dress. Now in some grove a listening friend thy false suggestions must attend. Thy whispered griefs, thy fancied sorrows here, Breathed in a sigh and witnessed by a tear, Whilst in the light and vulgar crowd Thy slaves more clamorous and loud By laughters unprovoked Thy influence to confess. In the imperious wife thou vapors art, Which from overheated passions Rise in clouds to the attractive brain, Until descending thence again through the overcast and showering eyes, upon her husband's softened heart. He the disputed point must yield, something resigned of the contested field, till lordly man, born to imperial sway, compounds for peace, to make that right away. And women, armed with spleen, do servilely obey. The fool, to imitate the wits, complains of thy pretended fits, and dullness born with him would lay upon thy accidental sway, because sometimes thou dost presume into the ablest heads to come, that often men of thoughts refined, impatient of unequal sense, such slow returns, where they so much dispense, retiring from the crowd, are to thy shades inclined. O'er me, alas, thou dost too much prevail. I feel thy force, whilst I against thee rail. I feel my verse decay, and my cramped numbers fail. Through thy black jauntest I all objects see, As dark and terrible as thee. My lines decried, and my employment thought a useless folly, Or presumptuous fault. Whilst in the muses' paths I stray, whilst in their groves and by their secret springs my hand delights to trace unusual things, and deviates from the known and common way. 
nor will in fading silks compose faintly the inimitable rose. Fill up an ill-drawn bird, or paint on glass the sovereign's blurred and undistinguished face, the threatening angel, and the speaking ass. Patron thou art to every gross abuse, the sullen husband's feigned excuse, when the ill humour with his wife he spends, and bears recruiting wit and spirits to his friends. The son of Bacchus pleads thy power, as to the glass he still repairs, pretends but to remove thy cares, snatch from thy shades one gay and smiling hour, and drown thy kingdom in a purple shower. When the coquette, whom every fool admires, would in variety be fair, and changing hastily the scene from light, impertinent and vain, assumes a soft and melancholy air, and her eyes rebates the wandering fires, the careless posture and the head recline, the thoughtful and composed face, proclaiming the withdrawal, the absent mind, allows the fop more liberty to gaze, who gently for the tender cause inquires, the cause, indeed, is a defect in sense, yet is the spleen alleged, and still the dull pretense. But these are thy fantastic harms, the tricks of thy pernicious stage, which do the weaker sort engage. Worse are the dire effects of thy more powerful charms. By thee, religion, all we know, that shouldst enlighten here below, is veiled in darkness, and perplexed with anxious doubts, with endless scruples vexed, and some restraint imply from each perverted text. Whilst touch not, taste not what is freely given, is but thy niggard voice, disgracing bounteous heaven, from speech restrained by thy deceits abused, to deserts banished, or in cells reclused, mistaken votaries to the powers divine, whilst they a pure sacrifice design, do but the spleen obey, and worship at thy shrine. In vain to chase thee every art we try, in vain all remedies apply, in vain the Indian leaf infuse, or the parched eastern berry bruise. Some pass in vain these bounds, and nobler liquors use. Now harmony in vain we bring, Inspire the flute, and touch the string. From harmony no help is had, Music but soothes thee, if too sweetly sad, And if too light, but turns thee gaily mad. Though the physician's greatest gains, Although his growing wealth he sees Daily increased by ladies' fees, Yet doth thou baffle all his studious pains not skilful lower thy source could find, or through the well-dissected body trace the secret, the mysterious ways, by which thou dost surprise and prey upon the mind. Though in the search, too deep for human thought, with unsuccessful toil he wrought, till thinking thee to've catched, himself by thee was caught, retained thy prisoner, thy acknowledged slave, and sunk beneath thy chain to a lamented grave. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Read by Alan Davis Drake. There's No Tomorrow by Anne Finch. Read for LibriVox.org. Too long had loved, and now the nymph desired, The cloak of wedlock, as the case required. Urged that, the day he wrought her to this sorrow, He vowed that he would marry her to-morrow. Agent, he swears, to shun the present storm, That he, to-morrow, will that vow perform. The morrows in their due successions came, Impatient still on each, the pregnant dame urged him to keep his word, and still he swore the same. When tired at length, and meaning no redress, and yet the lie not caring to confess, 
he for his oath this salvo chose to borrow that he was free since there was no to-morrow for when it comes in place to be employed tis then to-day to-morrow's ne'er enjoyed the tale's a jest the moral is a truth to-morrow and to-morrow cheat your youth in riper age to-morrow still we cry not thinking that the present day we die unpractised all the good we had designed there's no to-morrow to a willing mind end of poem this recording is in the public domain read for librivox.org by alan davis drake the inner vision by william wordsworth read for LibriVox.org. most sweet it is with unuplifted eyes to pace the ground if path there be or none while the fair region round the traveller lies which he forbears again to look upon pleased rather with some soft ideal scene the work of fancy or some happy tone of meditation slipping in between the beauty coming and the beauty gone if thought and love desert us from that day let us break off all commerce with the muse with thought and love companions of our way whate'er the senses take or may refuse the mind's internal heaven shall shed her dews of inspiration on the humblest lay. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Read by Alan Davis Drake. London by William Blake. Read for LibriVox.org by Anne Cheng. I wander through each chartered street, near where the chartered Thames does flow, and mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind-forged manacles I hear. How the chimney-sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlots curse, blasts the newborn infant's tear, and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Composed upon Westminster Bridge by William Wordsworth. Read for LibriVox.org by Anne Cheng. September 3rd, 1802 Earth has not anything to show more fair. Dull would he be of soul who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty. This city now doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning. Silent, bare, ships, towers, domes, theatres, and temples lie open unto the fields and to the sky, all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. Never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendour, valley, rock, or hill. Ne'er saw I, never felt, a calm so deep. The river glideth at his own sweet will. Dear God, the very houses seem asleep, and all that mighty heart is lying still. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Red Red Rose by Robert Burns. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Alexander Hewson. My love is like a red red rose that's newly sprung in June. My love is like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. So fair art thou, my bonny lass, so deep in love am I. 
And I will love thee still, my dear, till a the seas gang dry. Till a the seas gang dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun. And I will love thee still, my dear, or the sands of life shall run. And fare thee weel, my only love, and fare thee weel a while. And I will come again, my love, though it were ten thousand mile. End of A Red Red Rose This recording is in the public domain. Letter to Lord Chesterfield by Samuel Johnson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael Dowling Letter to Lord Chesterfield by Samuel Johnson February 1755 To the Right Honourable the Earl of Chesterfield My Lord, I have been lately informed by the proprietor of the world that two papers in which my dictionary is recommended to the public were written by your Lordship. To be so distinguished is an honour which, being very little accustomed to favours from the great, I know not well how to receive or in what terms to acknowledge. When, upon some slight encouragement, I first visited your lordship, I was overpowered, like the rest of mankind, by the enchantment of your address, and could not forbear to wish that I might boast myself le vainqueur du vainqueur de la terre, that I might obtain that regard for which I saw the world contending. But I found my attendance so little encouraged, that neither pride nor modesty would suffer me to continue it. When I had once addressed your lordship in public, I had exhausted all the art of pleasing which a retired and uncourtly scholar can possess. I had done all that I could, and no man is well pleased to have his all neglected, be it ever so little. Seven years, my lord, have now passed, since I waited in your outward rooms, or was repulsed from your door during which time I have been pushing on my work through difficulties of which it is useless to complain, and have brought it at last to the verge of publication, without one act of assistance, one word of encouragement, or one smile of favour. Such treatment I did not expect, for I never had a patron before. The shepherd in Virgil grew at last acquainted with love, and found him a native of the rocks. Is not a patron, my lord, one who looks with unconcern on a man struggling for life in the water, and, when he has reached ground, encumbers him with help. The notice which you have been pleased to take of my labours, had it been early, had been kind. But it has been delayed till I am indifferent, and cannot enjoy it, till I am solitary, and cannot impart it, till I am known, and do not want it. I hope it is no very cynical asperity not to confess obligations where no benefit has been received, or to be unwilling that the public should consider me as owing that to a patron which Providence has enabled me to do for myself. Having carried on my work thus far with so little obligation to any favourer of learning, I shall not be disappointed though I should conclude it, if less be possible, with less. For I have been long wakened from that dream of hope in which I once boasted myself, with so much exultation, my lord, your lordship's most humble, most obedient servant. Samuel Johnson. This recording is in the public domain. The Day of Judgment by Isaac Watts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by T. Wellington. The Day of Judgment. When the fierce north wind with his airy forces rears up the Baltic to a foaming fury, and the red lightning with a storm of hail comes rushing amain down, how the poor sailors stand amazed and tremble, while the hoarse thunder, like a bloody trumpet, roars a loud onset to the gaping waters quick to devour them. Such shall the noise be, and the wild disorder, if things eternal may be like these earthly. Such the dire terror when the great archangel shakes the creation. Tears, the strong pillars of the vault of heaven, breaks up old marble, 
the repose of princes, seize the graves open, and the bones arising, flames all around them. Hark the shrill outcries of the guilty wretches, lively bright horror and amazing anguish stare through their eyelids, while the living worm lies gnawing within them. Thoughts, like old vultures, prey upon their heartstrings, and the smart twinges, when the eye behold the lofty judge frowning, and a flood of vengeance rolling afore him. Hopeless immortals, how they scream and shiver, while devils push them to the pit, wide yawning, hideous and gloomy, to receive them headlong down to the center. Stop here, my fancy. All away, ye horrid, doleful ideas. Come arise to Jesus, how he sits godlike, and the saints around him throned, yet adoring. Oh, may I sit there when he comes triumphant, dooming the nations. Then ascend to glory, while our hosannas all along the passage shout, The Redeemer. End of poem, The Day of Judgment, by Isaac Watts. This recording, read by T. Wellington, is in the public domain. Wrestling Jacob by Charles Wesley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by T. Wellington. Wrestling Jacob. Come, O thou traveler unknown, whom still I hold but cannot see. My company before is gone and I am left alone with thee. With thee all night I mean to stay, and wrestle till the break of day. I need not tell thee who I am, my misery or sin declare. Thyself hast called me by my name. Look on thy hands and read it there. But who, I ask thee, who art thou? Tell me thy name, and tell me now. In vain thou strugglest to get free, I never will unloose my hold. Art thou the man who died for me? The secret of thy love unfold, Wrestling I will not let thee go, Till I thy name thy nature know. Tis all in vain to hold thy tongue, Or touch the hollow of my thigh. Though every sinew be unstrung, Out of my arms thou shalt not fly. Wrestling I will not let thee go, Till I thy name thy nature know. My strength is gone, my nature dies. I sink beneath thy weighty hand, faint to revive, and fall to rise. I fall, and yet by faith I stand, I stand, and will not let thee go, till I thy name, thy nature know. Yield to me now, for I am weak, but confident in self-despair. Speak to my heart, in blessings speak. Be conquered by my instant prayer. Speak, or thou never hence shall move. And tell me if thy name is love. Tis love, tis love, thou diedst for me. I hear thy whisper in my heart. The morning breaks, the shadows flee. Pure, universal love thou art. To me, to all, Thy bowels move, thy nature and thy name is love. Contented now upon my thigh, I halt till life's short journey end. All helplessness, all weakness I, on thee alone for strength depend. Nor have I power from thee to move, thy nature and thy name is love. Lame as I am, I take the prey. Hell, earth, and sin, with ease o'ercome. I leap for joy, pursue my way, And as a bounding heart fly home, Through all eternity to prove Thy nature, and thy name is love. End of poem, Wrestling Jacob, by Charles Wesley. This recording, read by T. Wellington, Is in the public domain. A Cradle Hymn by Isaac Watts. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by T. Wellington. A Cradle Hymn Hush, my dear, lie still in slumber. Holy angels guard thy bed. Heavenly blessings without number, gently falling on thy head. Sleep, my babe, thy food and raiment. House and home thy friends provide. All without thy care or payment. All thy wants are well supplied. How much better thou art attended than the Son of God could be, when from heaven he descended and became a child like thee. Soft and easy is thy cradle, coarse and hard thy Savior lay, when his birthplace was a stable, and his softest bed was hay. Blessed babe, what glorious features, spotless hair, divinely bright! Must he dwell with brutal creatures? How could angels bear the sight? Was there nothing but a manger? cursed sinners could afford, to receive the heavenly stranger? Did they thus affront their Lord? Soft, my child, I did not chide thee, though my song might sound too hard. Tis thy mother sits beside thee, and her arms shall be thy guard. Yet to read the shameful story, how the Jews abused their king, how they served the Lord of glory, makes me angry while I sing. See the kinder shepherds round him, telling wonders from the sky. Where they sought him, there they found him, with his virgin mother by. See the lovely babe addressing, lovely infant, how he smiled. When he wept, the mother's blessing, soothed and hushed the holy child. Lo, he slumbers in a manger, where the horned oxen fed. Peace, my darling, here's no danger, here's no ox anear thy bed. T'was to save thee, child, from dying, save my dear from burning flame, bitter groans and endless crying, that thy blessed Redeemer came. Mayst thou live to know and fear him, trust and love him all thy days. Then go dwell for ever near him, see his face, and sing his praise. End of poem A Cradle Hymn by Isaac Watts. This recording, read by T. Wellington, is in the public domain. Care for the Lowest by William Cowper. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake I would not enter on my list of friends, Though graced with polished manners and fine sense, Yet wanting sensibility, The man who needlessly sets foot upon a worm. An inadvertent step may crush the snail That crawls at evening in the public path, But he that has humanity forewarned Will tread aside and let the reptile live. The creeping vermin, loathsome to the sight, and charged, perhaps with venom, that intrudes a visitor unwelcome into scenes sacred to neatness and repose, the alcove, the chamber, or refectory, may die. A necessary act incurs no blame. Not so when, held within their proper bounds, and guiltless of offence, they range the air, or take their pastime in the spacious field. There they are privileged, and he that hurts or harms them there is guilty of a wrong. Disturbs the economy of nature's realm, who, when she formed, designed them an abode. The sum is this. If man's convenience, health, or safety interfere, his rights and claims are paramount, and must extinguish theirs. Else they are all, the meanest things that are, as free to live and to enjoy that life as God was free to form them at the first, who in his sovereign wisdom made them all. Ye therefore who love mercy, 
teach your sons to love it too. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Love's Secret by William Blake This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jane Greensmith of JaneGS.com Love's Secret by William Blake Never seek to tell thy love, love that never told can be, for the gentle wind doth move silently, invisibly. I told my love, I told my love, I told her all my heart, trembling, cold, and ghastly fears. Ah, she did depart. Soon after she was gone from me, a traveler came by. Silently, invisibly, he took her with a sigh. End of Love's Secret This recording is in the public domain. One and Twenty by Samuel Johnson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. One and Twenty by Samuel Johnson. Long expected one and twenty, lingering year at length is flown. Pride and pleasure, pomp and plenty, great are now your own. Loosened from the miner's tether, free to mortgage or to sell, wild as wind and light as feather, bid the sons of thrift farewell. Call the Betsies, Kates and Jennies, all the names that banish care, lavish of your grandsire's guineas, show the spirit of an heir. All that prey on vice and folly, joy to see their quarry fly, there the gamester, light and jolly, there the lender, grave and sly. Wolf, my lad, was made to wander, let it wander as it will. Call the jockey, call the panda, bid them come and take their fill. When the bonny blade carouses, pockets full and spirits high, what are acres, what are houses, only dirt or wet or dry? Should the guardian, friend or mother, Tell the woes of willful waste. Scorn their counsel, scorn their pother. You can hang or drown at last. End of 1 and 20 This recording is in the public domain. I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud by William Wordsworth This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud by William Wordsworth I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought, what wealth the show to me had brought for oft when on my couch i lie in vacant or in pensive mood they flash upon that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude and then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils end of i wandered lonely as a cloud this recording is in the public domain From a speech given in the House of Commons on India in 1783 by Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael Dowling. From a speech given in the House of Commons on India in 1783 by Edmund Burke. Our conquest there, after twenty years, is as crude as it was the first day. The natives scarcely know what it is to see the grey head of an Englishman. Young men, boys almost, govern there, without society and without sympathy with the natives. They have no more social habits with the people than if they still resided in England, nor, indeed, any species of intercourse but that which is necessary to making a sudden fortune with a view to a remote settlement. Animated with all the avarice of age, and all the impetuosity of youth, they roll in, one after another, wave after wave, and there is nothing before the eyes of the natives but an endless, hopeless prospect of new flights of birds of prey and passage, with appetites continually renewing for a food that is continually wasting. Every rupee of profit made by an Englishman is lost for ever to India. With us, and no tributary superstitions, by which a foundation of charity compensates through ages to the poor for the rapine and injustice of a day. With us no pride erects stately monuments, which repair the mischiefs which pride had produced, and which adorn a country out of its own spoils. England has erected no churches, no hospitals, no palaces, no schools. England has built no bridges, made no high roads, cut no navigations, dug out no reservoirs. Every other conqueror of every other description has left some monument, either of state or beneficence, behind him. Were we to be driven out of India this day, nothing would remain to tell that it had been possessed, during the inglorious period of our dominion, by anything better than the orang, orang, or the tiger. There is nothing in the boys we send to India worse than in the boys whom we are whipping at school, or that we see trailing a pike, or bending over a desk at home. But as English youth in India drink the intoxicating draught of authority and dominion before their heads are able to bear it, and as they are full-grown in fortune long before they are ripe in principle, neither nature nor reason have any opportunity to exert themselves for remedy at the excesses of their premature power. The consequences of their con conduct, which in good minds, and many of theirs are probably such, might produce penitence or amendment, are unable to pursue the rapidity of their flight. Their prey is lodged in England, and the cries of India are given to seas and winds to be blown about, in every breaking up of the monsoon, over a remote and unhearing ocean. In India all the vices operate by which sudden fortune is acquired. In England are often displayed by the same persons the virtues which dispense hereditary wealth. Arrived in England, the destroyers, the nobility and gentry of a whole kingdom, will find the best company in this nation, at a board of elegance and hospitality. Here the manufacturer and husbandman will bless the just and punctual hand that in India has torn the cloth from the loom, or wrested the scanty portion of rice and salt from the peasant of Bengal, or wrung from him the very opium in which he forgets his oppressions and his oppressor. They marry into your families, they enter into your senate, they ease your estates by loans, they raise their value by demand. They cherish and protect your relations, which lie heavy on your patronage, and there is scarcely a house in the kingdom that does not feel some concern and interest that makes all the reform of our eastern government appear officious and disgusting, and on the whole a most discouraging attempt. In such an attempt you hurt those who are able to return kindness, or to resent injury. If you succeed, you save those who cannot so much as give you thanks. All these things show the difficulty of the work we have on hand but they show its necessity too. Our Indian government is in its best state a grievance. It is necessary that the corrective should be uncommonly vigorous, and the work of men sanguine, warm, and even impassioned in the cause. But it is an arduous thing to plead against the abuses of a power which originates from your own country, and affects those whom we are used to consider as strangers. End of extract this recording is in the public domain.
Crucifixion to the World by the Cross of Christ by Isaac Watts. This recording is in the public domain. Crucifixion to the World by the Cross of Christ. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow, mingle down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? His dying crimson, like a robe, spreads o'er his body on the tree. Then am I dead to all the globe, and all the globe is dead to me. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. End of poem by Isaac Watts. This recording is in the public domain. A Debtor to Mercy Alone by Augustus Montague Toplady Read for LibriVox.org by T. Wellington A Debtor to Mercy Alone A debtor to mercy alone, of covenant mercy I sing, nor fear with thy righteousness on, my person and offering to bring. The terrors of law and of God with me can have nothing to do. My Savior's obedience and blood hide all my transgressions from view. The work which His goodness began, the arm of His strength will complete. His promise is yes and amen, and never was forfeited yet. Things future, nor things that are now, nor all things below or above, can make Him His purpose forgo or sever my soul from his love. My name from the palms of his hands eternity will not erase. Impressed on his heart it remains, in marks of indelible grace. Yes, I to the end shall endure, as sure as the earnest is given. More happy, but not more secure, the glorified spirits in heaven. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Shepherd Boy Sings in the Valley of Humiliation by John Bunyan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by T. Wellington. The shepherd boy sings in the valley of humiliation. He that is down needs fear no fall. He that is low no pride. He that is humble ever shall have God to be his guide. I am content with what I have, little be it or much. And, Lord, contentment still I crave, because thou savest such. Fullness to such a burden is that go on pilgrimage. Here little and hereafter bliss, is best from age to age. End of the poem, The Shepherd Boy Sings in the Valley of Humiliation by John Bunyan. This recording, read by T. Wellington, is in the public domain. Ode on a Grecian Urn by John Keats This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by David Fetterman. Ode on a Grecian Urn by John Keats Thou still unravished bride of quietness, Thou foster child of silence and slow time, Sylvan historian, who canst thus express A flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme? What leaf-fringed legend haunts about thy shape? 
of deities or mortals or of both, in Tempe or the dales of Arcady. What men or gods are these? What maidens loathe? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, ye soft pipes, play on. Not to the sensual ear, but more endeared. Pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone. Fair youth beneath the trees, thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever canst those trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss, though winning near to the goal, yet do not grieve. She cannot fade, though thou hast not thy bliss, for ever wilt thou love, and she be fair. Ah, happy, happy bows, that cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid the spring adieu. And happy, melodist, unwearied, forever piping songs, forever new. More happy love, more happy, happy love, forever warm and still to be enjoyed, forever panting and forever young, all breathing human passion far above, that leaves a heart high sorrowful and cloyed a burning forehead and a parching tongue. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, O mysterious priest, leadst thou that heifer lowing at the skies, and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed? What little town by river or seashore, or mountain built with peaceful citadel, is emptied of this folk, this pious morn? And little town thy streets forevermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can e'er return. O attic shape, fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought, with forest branches and the trodden weed, thou silent form dost tease us out of thought, as doth eternity. Cold pastoral, when old age shall this generation waste, Thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man to whom thou sayest, Beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all ye know on earth, and all ye need to know. End of Ode on a Grecian Urn. This recording is in the public domain. Kublai Khan by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by David Fetterman. Kublai Khan by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. In Xanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree. Or Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers were girdled round, and there were gardens bright with sinuous rills, where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree. And here were forests ancient as the hills, enfolding sunny spots of greenery. But, oh, that deep romantic chasm, which slanted down the green hill athwart a cedarn cover, a savage place, as holy and enchanted as e'er beneath a waning moon was haunted by woman wailing for her demon lover. And from this chasm, with a ceaseless turmoil seething, as if this earth in fast thick pants were breathing, a mighty fountain momently was forced, Amid whose swift, half-intermitted burst, Huge fragments vaulted like rebounding hail, Or chaffy grain beneath the thresher's flail. And mid these dancing rocks, at once and ever, It flung up, momently, the sacred river, Five miles meandering with a mazy motion, Through wood and dale the sacred river ran, Then reached the caverns measureless to man, And sank in tumult to a lifeless ocean. And mid this tumult, Kubla heard from far ancestral voices prophesying war. The shadow of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves, where was heard the mingled measure from the fountain 
and the caves. It was a miracle of rare device, a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice. A damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw. It was an Abyssinian maid, and on her dulcimer she played, sing of Mount Abora. Could I revive within me her symphony and song, to such a deep delight twould win me, that with music loud and long I would build that dome in air, that sunny dome, those caves of ice, and all who heard should see them there, and all should cry, Beware! beware. His flashing eyes, his floating hair, weave a circle round him thrice, and close your eyes with holy dread, for he on honeydew hath fed, and drunk the milk of paradise. End of Kublai Khan. This recording is in the public domain. A Satirical Elegy on the Death of a Late Famous General by Jonathan Swift This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by David Fetterman A Satirical Elegy on the Death of a Late Famous General by Jonathan Swift His Grace! Impossible! What? Dead? Of old age, too, and in his bed? And could that mighty warrior fall, and so inglorious, after all? Well, since he's gone, no matter how, the last loud trump must wake him now. And trust me, as the noise grows stronger, he'd wish to sleep a little longer. And could he be indeed so old, as by the newspapers we're told? Three score, I think, is pretty high. Twas time in conscience he should die. In this world he cumbered long enough. He burnt his candle to the snuff. And that's the reason some folks think he left behind so great a stink. Behold, his funeral appears. Nor widows' sighs, nor orphans' tears, want at such times each heart to pierce. Attend the progress of his hearse. But what of that, his friends may say? He had those honors in his day. True to his profit and his pride, he made them weep before he died. Come hither, all ye empty things, ye bubbles raised by breath of kings, who float upon the tide of state. Come hither, and behold your fate. Let pride be taught by this rebuke, how very mean a thing's a duke. From all his ill-got honors flung, Turn to that dirt from whence he sprung. End of a satirical elegy on the death of a late famous general. This recording is in the public domain. One and Twenty by Samuel Johnson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by David Fetterman. One and Twenty by Samuel Johnson. Long expected one and twenty, lingering year at length is flown, pride and pleasure, pomp and plenty. Great Sir John are now your own. Loosened from the miner's tether, free to mortgage or to sell, wild as wind and light as feather. Bid the sons of thrift farewell. Call the Betsies, Kates, and Jennies, all the names that banish care, lavish of your grandsire's guineas, show the spirit of an heir. All that prey on vice and folly, joy to see their quarry fly. There the gamester light and jolly, there the lender, grave and sly. Wealth, my lad, was made to wander. Let it wander as it will. Call the jockey, call the pander. Bid them come and take their fill. When the bonny blade grouses, pockets full and spirits high, 
What are acres? What are houses? Only dirt, or wet, or dry. Should the guardian friend or mother tell the woes of willful waste? Scorn their counsel, scorn their pother. You can hang or drown at last. End of one and twenty. This recording is in the public domain. On a Favorite Cat Drowned in a Tub of Goldfishes by Thomas Gray. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by David Fetterman. On a Favorite Cat Drowned in a Tub of Goldfishes by Thomas Gray. Twas on a lofty vase's side, where China's gayest art had died, the azure flowers that blow, demurest of the tabby kind. The pensive Salima reclined, gazed on the lake below. Her conscious tale, her joy declared, the fair round face, the snowy beard, the velvet of her paws, her coat with that tortoise vise, her ears of jet and emerald eyes, she saw and purred applause. Still had she gazed, but midst the tide, two angel forms were seen to glide, the genii of the stream, their scaly armors to rein hue, throw richest purple to the view, betrayed a golden gleam. The hapless nymph with wonder saw a whisker first, and then a claw, with many an ardent wish. She stretched in vain to reach the prize. What female heart can gold despise? What cats averse to fish? Presumptuous maid, with looks intent, again she stretched, again she bent, nor knew the gulf between. Malignant fate sat by and smiled. The slippery verge her feet beguiled. She tumbled headlong in. Eight times emerging from the flood, she mewed to every watery god, some speedy aid to send. No dolphin came, no nereid stirred, nor cruel Tom, nor Susan heard. A favorite has no friend. From hence, ye beauties, undeceived. No, one false step is ne'er retrieved. And be with caution bold, not all that tempts your wandering eyes and heedless hearts is lawful prize, nor all that blisters gold. End of On a Favorite Cat Drowned in a Tub of Goldfishes. This recording is in the public domain. A Poison Tree by William Blake. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Fetterman. A Poison Tree by William Blake. I was angry with my friend. I told my wrath. My wrath did end. I was angry with my foe. I told it not. My wrath did grow. And I watered it in fears, night and morning with my tears. And I sunned it with smiles, and with soft, deceitful wiles. And it grew both day and night, till it bore an apple bright. And my foe beheld it shine, and he knew that it was mine. And into my garden stole, when the night had veiled the pole. In the morning glad I see my foe outstretched beneath the tree. End of a poison tree. This recording is in the public domain. Prometheus by Lord Byron. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
read by David Fetterman. Prometheus by Lord Byron. Titan, to whose immortal eyes the sufferings of mortality seen in their sad reality were not as things that gods despise. What was thy pity's recompense? A silent suffering and intense. The rock, the vulture, and the chain. All that the proud can feel of pain. The agony they do not show. The suffocating sense of woe. Which speaks but in its loneliness. And then is jealous lest the sky Should have a listener, nor will sigh until its voice is echoless. Titan, to thee the strife was given, between the suffering and the will, which torture where they cannot kill, and the inexorable heaven, and the deaf tyranny of fate, the ruling principle of hate, which for its pleasure doth create the things it may annihilate, refused thee even the boon to die, the wretched gift eternity was thine, and thou hast borne it well. All that the thunderer wrung from thee was but the menace which flung back on him the torments of thy rack. The fate thou did so well foresee, but would not to appease him tell. And in thy silence was his sentence, and in his soul a vain repentance and evil dread so ill dissembled, that in his hand the lightnings trembled. Thy godlike crime was to be kind, to render with thy precepts less the sum of human wretchedness, and strengthen man with his own mind, but baffled as thou wert from high. Still, in thy patient energy, in the endurance and repulse of thine impenetrable spirit, which heaven and earth could not convulse, a mighty lesson we inherit. Thou art a symbol and a sign to mortals of their fate and force. Like thee, man is in part divine, a troubled stream from a pure source, and man in portions can foresee his own funereal destiny, his wretchedness and his resistance, and his sad, unallied existence, to which his spirit may oppose itself, and equal to all woes, and a firm will and a deep sense, which even in torture can descry its own concentered recompense, triumphant where it dares defy, and making death a victory. End of Prometheus. This recording is in the public domain. The Origin of Trades by Voltaire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by David Fetterman. The Origin of Trades by Voltaire When with a skillful hand Prometheus made A statue that the human form displayed, Pandora, his own work to wed he chose, And from those two the human race arose. When first to know herself the fair began, She played her smile's enchantment upon man, by softness and alluring speech she gained, The ascendant and her master soon enchained. Her beauty on Prometheus's sense ne'er palled, And the first husband was the first enthralled. The god of war soon saw the new-formed fair, His manly beauty and his martial air, His golden cask and all his glittering arms. Pandora pleased, and he enjoyed her charms. When the sea's ruler in his humid court had heard of this intrigue from fame's report, 
the fair he sought, a like reception found. Could Neptune fail, were Mars a triumph found? Day's light-haired god from his resplendent height, their pleasures saw and hoped the same delight. She could not to refuse him have the heart, who o'er the day presides, and every art. Mercury with eloquence declared his flame, and in his turn he triumphed o'er the dame. Squalid and sooty from his forge, at first Vulcan was ill-received and gave disgust. But he by importunity obtained what other gods with so much ease had gained. Pandora's prime thus winged with pleasure flew, then she in languor lived, nor wherefore knew. She that devotes to love her life's first spring, as years increase, can do no other thing. For e'en to gods inconstancy is known, and those who dwell in heaven to change are prone. Pandora of her favors had been free to gods who left her, happening then to see. A satyr who through plains and meadows strayed, smit with his mien, she love advances made. To these amours our race existence owes, from such amusements all mankind arose. Hence those varieties and talents spring, ingenious passions, business, everything. To Vulcan one, to Mars one owes his birth, this to a satyr. Very few on earth. Claim any kindred with the god of day. Few that celestial origin display. From parents each his taste and turn derives. But most of all trades, now Pandora's thrives. The most delightful, though least rare it seems. And is the trade all Paris most esteems. End of the Origin of Trades. This recording is in the public domain. The Copernican System by Thomas Chatterton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by David Fetterman. The Copernican System by Thomas Chatterton The sun revolving on his axis turns, And with creative fire intensely burns. Impelled by force of air, our earth supreme Rolls with the planets round the solar gleam. First Mercury completes his transient year, Glowing, refulgent, with reflected glare. Bright Venus occupies a wider way, The early harbinger of night and day. More distant still, our globe to Requius turns, Nor chills intense, nor fiercely heated burns. Around her rolls the lunar orb of light, Trailing her silver glories through the night. On the Earth's orbit see the various signs, Mark where the sun our year completing shines. First the bright ram, his languid ray improves, Next glaring watery throw, the bull he moves. The amorous twins admit his genial ray, Now burning throw the crab he takes his way. The lion flaming bears the solar power, The virgin faints beneath the sultry shower. Now the just balance weighs his equal force, The slimy serpent swelters in his course. The sabled archer clouds his languid face, The goat with tempest urges on his race. Now in the water his faint beams appear, And the cold fishes end the circling year. Beyond our globe the sanguine Mars displays A strong reflection of primeval rays. Next belted Jupiter far distant gleams, scarcely enlightened with the solar beams. 
with four unfixed receptacles of light. He tours majestic through the spacious height, but farther yet the tardy Saturn lags, and five attendant luminaries drags. Investing with a double ring his pace, he circles through immensity of space. These are thy wondrous works, first source of good, now more admired in being understood. End of the Copernican System This recording is in the public domain. A Portrait Addressed to Mrs. Crewe with the Comedy of the School for Scandal by Richard Brinsley Sheridan This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Rhonda Fetterman. A Portrait Addressed to Mrs. Crewe with the Comedy of the School for Scandal by Richard Brinsley Sheridan Tell me, ye prim adepts in scandal's school, who rail by precept and detract by rule, Lives there no character so tried, so known, so decked with grace, and so unlike your own, that even you assist her fame to raise, approve by envy and by silent praise? Attend! A model shall attract your view. Daughters of calumny, I summon you. You shall decide if this is a portrait prove, or a fond creation of the muse and love. Attend, ye virgin critics, shrewd and sage, ye matron censors of this childish age, whose peering eye and wrinkled front declare a fixed antipathy to young and fair, by cunning cautious, or by nature cold, in maiden madness virulently bold. Attend, Ye skilled to coin the precious tale, Creating proof, wherein innuendos fail, Whose practised memories cruelly exact, Omit no circumstance, except the fact. Attend all ye who boast, or old, or young, The living libel of the slanderous tongue. So shall my theme, as far contrasted be, as saints by fiends or hymns by calumny. Come, gentle amoret, for neath that name in worthier verse is sung thy beauty's fame. Come, for but thee who seeks the muse, and while celestial blushes check thy conscious smile, with timid grace and hesitating eye the perfect model which I boast supply, Vain muse, couldst thou the humblest sketch create, Of her, or slightest charm, couldst imitate? Could thy blessed strain in kindred colours trace The faintest wonder of her form and face? Poets would study the immortal line, And Reynolds own his art subdued by thine. That art, which well might added lustre give, to nature's best and heaven's superlative. On Granby's cheek might bid new glories rise, or point a purer beam from Devon's eyes. Hard is the task to shape that beauty's praise, whose judgment scorns the homage flattery pays. But praising Amoret we cannot err, no tongue or values heaven or flatters her. Yet she by fate's perverseness, she alone, Would doubt our truth, nor deem such praise her own. Adorning fashion, unadorned by dress, Simple from taste, and not from carelessness, Discreet in gesture, in deportment mild, Not stiff with prudence, nor uncouthly wild. No state has amorate, no studied mien, she frowns no goddess, and she moves no queen. The softer charm that in her manner lies Is framed to captivate, yet not surprise. It justly suits the expression of her face. Tis less than dignity, 
and more than grace. On her pure cheek the native hue is such, that formed by heaven to be admired so much, the hand divine with a less partial care might well have fixed a fainter crimson there, and bade the gentle inmate of her breast, enshrined modesty, supply the rest. But who the peril of her lips shall paint? Strip them of smiles, still, still all words are faint. But moving love himself appears to teach their action, though denied to rule her speech. And thou who seest her speak, and dost not hear, mourn not her distant accents scape thine ear. Viewing those lips, thou still mayst make pretense, to judge of what she says, and swear, tis sense. Clothed with such grace, with such expression fraught, they move in meaning, and they pause in thought. But dost thou farther watch, with charmed surprise, The mild irresolution of her eyes? Curious to mark how frequent they repose, In brief eclipse and momentary close. Ah, seest thou not an ambushed Cupid there, Too timorous of his charge, with jealous care? Veils and unveils those beams of heavenly light, Too full? too fatal else for mortal sight? Nor yet such pleasing vengeance fond to meet, in pardoning dimples hope a safe retreat. What though her peaceful breast should ne'er allow, subduing frowns to arm her altered brow? By love I swear, and by his gentle wiles, more fatal still the mercy of her smiles. Thus lovely, thus adorned, possessing all, of bright or fair, that can to woman fall. The height of vanity might well be thought prerogative in her, and nature's fault. Yet gentle amoret, in mind supreme, as well as charms, rejects the vainer theme and half mistrustful of her beauty's store, she barbs with wit those darts too keen before, read in all knowledge that her sex should reach, though Greville or the muse should deign to teach. Fond to improve, nor timorous to discern, how far it is a woman's grace to learn. In Miller's dialect she would not prove, Apollo's priestess, but Apollo's love. Graced by those signs with truth delights to own, the timid blush and mild submitted tone. Whate'er she says, though sense appear throughout, displays the tender hue of female doubt. Decked with that charm, how lovely wit appears, how graceful science when that robe she wears. Such, too, her talents, and her bent of mind, as speak a sprightly heart by thought refined. A taste for mirth, by contemplation schooled, a turn for ridicule, by candor ruled, a scorn of folly, which she tries to hide, an awe of talent, which she owns with pride. Peace, idle muse, no more thy strain prolong, But yield a theme, thy warmest praises wrong. Just to her merit, though thou canst not raise Thy feeble verse, behold, the acknowledged praise, Has spread conviction through the envious train, And cast a fatal gloom o'er scandal's reign. And lo! Each pallid hag with blistered tongue Mutters assent to all thy zeal has sung, Owns all the colors just, the outline true, Thee my inspirer, and my model, crew. 
End of a portrait. This recording is in the public domain. To the Poor by Anna Letitia Barbald. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Rhonda Fetterman. To the Poor by Anna Letitia Barbald. Child of distress, who meets the bitter scorn of fellow men to happier prospects born doomed art and nature's various stores to see flow in full cups of joy and not for thee who sees the rich to heaven and fate resigned bear thy afflictions with a patient mind whose bursting heart disdains unjust control who feels depression's iron in thy soul who drags the load of faint and feeble years, whose bread is anguish, and whose water tears. Bear, bear thy wrongs, fulfill thy destined hour, bend thy meek neck beneath the foot of power. But when thou feel'st the great deliverer nigh, and thy freed spirit mounting seeks the sky, let no vain fears thy parting hour molest, No whispered terrors shake thy quiet breast. Think not their threats can work thy future woe, Nor deem the Lord above like lords below. Safe in the bosom of that love repose, By whom the sun gives light, the ocean flows. Prepare to meet a father undismayed, Nor fear the God whom priests and kings have made. End of To the Poor This recording is in the public domain. Moon by Henry Rowe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Esmeralda Jones Thee too, modest tressed maid, When thy fallen stars appear, When in lawn of fire arrayed, Sovereign of yon powdered sphere, To thee I chant at close of day, Beneath, O oh maiden moon, thy ray, Throned in sapphired ring supreme, Pregnant with celestial juice, On silver wing thy diamond stream Gives what summer hours produce, While viewed impearled earth's rich inlay, Beneath, O oh maiden moon, thy ray. Glad, pale, Cynthian wine I sip, Breathe the flowery leaves among, Draughts delicious wet my lip, Drowned in nectar drunk my song, While tuned to Philomel the lay, Beneath, O oh maiden moon, thy ray. Dew that odorous ointment yields, Sweets that western winds disclose, Bathing springs more purpled fields, Softs the band that wins the rose. While o'er oh, the myrtled lawns I stray, Beneath, O oh maiden moon, thy ray. End of moon. This recording is in the public domain. The Garden of Love by William Blake. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Caroline Schumacher The Garden of Love by William Blake I went to the Garden of Love, of Love, and saw what I never had seen. A chapel was built in the midst, where I used to play on the green. And the gates of this chapel were shut, and thou shalt not rid over the door, 
So I turned to the garden of love that many sweet bowers bore, and I saw it was filled with graves and tombstones where flowers should be, and priests in black gowns were walking their rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires. End of recording. This recording is in the public domain. On Virtue by Phyllis Wheatley This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Rhonda Fetterman On Virtue by Phyllis Wheatley O oh, thou bright jewel in my aim, I strive to comprehend thee. Thine own words declare wisdom is higher than a fool can reach. I cease to wonder and no more attempt thine height to explore, or fathom thy profound. But, O oh, my soul, sink not into despair. Virtue is near thee and with gentle hand would now embrace thee, hovers over thine head. Fain would the heaven-born soul with her converse, then seek, then court her for her promised bliss. Auspicious queen, thine heavenly pinions spread, and lead celestial chastity along. Lo, now her sacred retinue descends, arrayed in glory from the orbs above. Attend me, virtue, through my youthful years. O oh, leave me not to the false joys of time, but guide my steps to endless life and bliss. Greatness or goodness, say what I shall call thee, to give me an higher appellation still. Teach me a better strain, a nobler lay. O oh, thou, enthroned with cherubs in the realms of day. End of On Virtue. This recording is in the public domain. Songs of Innocence by William Blake. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Joanna Policina. Songs of Innocence by William Blake. Piping down the valleys wild, piping songs of pleasant glee, on a cloud I saw a child, and he laughing said to me, Pipe a song about a lamb, so I piped with merry cheer. Piper, pipe that song again. So I piped, he wept to hear. Drop thy pipe, thy happy pipe, Sing thy songs of happy cheer. So I sang the same again, While he wept with joy to hear. Piper, sit thee down and write In a book that all may read. So he vanished from my sight, And I plucked a hollow reed. And I made a rural pen, And I stained the water clear. And I wrote my happy songs, Every child may joy to hear. End of Songs of Innocence this recording is in the public domain. Without Distinction by Major Henry Livingston This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Joanna Policina Without Distinction by Major Henry Livingston Without distinction, fame or note, Upon the tide of life I float, A bubble almost lost to sight, As cobweb frail as vapor light, And yet within that bubble lies A spark of life which never dies. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Hills of Home by Witter Biner This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Read by Joanna Policina. Hills of Home by Witter Biner. Name me no names for my disease, with uniforming breath. I tell you I am none of these, but homesick unto death. 
homesick for hills that I had known, for brooks that I had crossed, before I met this flesh and bone, and followed and was lost. And though they break my heart at last, yet name no name of ills, say only, here is where he passed, seeking again those hills. End of Hills of Home This recording is in the public domain. Young and Old by Charles Kingsley This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Read by Joanna Policina Young and Old by Charles Kingsley When all the world is young, lad, and all the trees are green, And every goose a swan, lad, and every lass a queen, then hay for boot and horse, lad, and round the world away. Young blood must have its course, lad, and every dog his day. When all the world is old, lad, and all the trees are brown, And all the sport is stale, lad, and all the wheels run down, Creep home and take your place there, the spent and maimed among. God grant you find one face there you loved when all was young. End of Young and Old this recording is in the public domain. The Nightingale and the Glowworm by William Cowper Read for LibriVox.org by Carol Stripling a nightingale that all day long had cheered the village with his song, nor yet at eve his note suspended, nor yet when eventide was ended, began to feel, as well he might, the keen demands of appetite. When, looking eagerly around, he spied far off upon the ground a something shining in the dark, and knew the glow-worm by his spark. So, stooping down from hawthorn top, he thought to put him in his crop. The worm, aware of his intent, harangued him thus right eloquent. Did you admire my lamp, quoth he, as much as I your minstrelsy? You would abhor to do me wrong as much as I to spoil your song, for twas the self-same power divine taught you to sing and me to shine that you with music, I with light, might beautify and cheer the night. The songster heard his short oration, and warbling out his approbation, released him, as my story tells, and found a supper somewhere else. End of The Nightingale and the Glowworm by William Cowper This recording is in the public domain. Had I a Heart for Falsehood Framed by Richard Brinsley Sheridan This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by David Fetterman Had I a Heart for Falsehood Framed by Richard Brinsley Sheridan Had I a Heart for falsehood framed, I ne'er could injure you, For though your tongue no promise claimed, Your charms would make me true. To you no soul shall bear deceit, No stranger offer wrong, But friends in all the aged you'll meet, And lovers in the young. For when they learn that you have blessed Another with your heart, They'll bid aspiring passion rest, and act a brother's part. Then, lady, dread not here deceit, nor fear to suffer wrong, for friends in all the aged you'll meet, and lovers in the young. End of Had I a Heart for Falsehood Framed. This recording is in the public domain. Solitude by Alexander Pope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Read by Rhonda Fetterman. Solitude by Alexander Pope. Happy the man whose wish and care a few paternal acres bound, content to breathe his native air in his own ground. Whose herds with milk, whose fields with bread, whose flocks supply him with attire, whose trees in summer yield shade, in winter fire. Blessed who can unconcernedly find hours, days, and years slide soft away in health of body, peace of mind, quiet by day. Sound sleep by night, study and ease, together mixed, sweet recreation, and innocence which most does please with meditation. Thus let me live, unseen, unknown, thus unlamented let me die. Steal from the world, and not a stone tell where I lie. End of Solitude. This recording is in the public domain. If Lawyer's Hand is Feed by John Gay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Rhonda Fetterman. If Lawyer's Hand is Feed by John Gay. A fox may steal your hen, sir, a whore your health and pence, sir, your daughter rob your chest, sir, your wife may steal your rest, sir, a thief your goods and plate. But this is all but picking, with rest, pence, chest, and chicken. It ever was decreed, sir, if lawyer's hand is feed, sir, he steals your whole estate. End of If Lawyer's Hand is Feed. This recording is in the public domain. An Elegy on the Death of a Mad Dog by Oliver Goldsmith. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Rhonda Fetterman. An Elegy on the Death of a Mad Dog by Oliver Goldsmith Good people all, of every sort, give ear unto my song. And if you find it wondrous short, it cannot hold you long. In Islington there was a man, of whom the world might say, that still a godly race he ran, whene'er he went to pray. A kind and gentle heart he had, to comfort friends and foes. The naked every day he clad, when he put on his clothes. And in that town a dog was found, as many dogs there be, both mongrel, puppy, whelp, and hound, and curs of low degree. This dog and man at first were friends, but when a peak began, the dog, to gain his private ends, went mad and bit the man. Around from all the neighboring streets the wondering neighbors ran, and swore the dog had lost his wits to bite so good a man. The wound, it seemed, both sore and sad to every Christian eye, and while they swore the dog was mad, they swore the man would die. But soon a wonder came to light that showed the rogues they lied. The man recovered of the bite, the dog it was, that died. End of An Elegy on the Death of a Mad Dog this recording is in the public domain. Sonnet One by Anna Seward. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Rhonda Fetterman. Sonnet One by Anna Seward. When life's realities the soul perceives, vain, dull, perchance corrosive, if she glows with rising energy and open throws the golden gates of genius, she achieves his fairy climb delighted, and receives in those gay paths, decked with the thornless rose, blessed compensation. Lo, with altered brows lours the false world, and the fine spirit grieves. No more young hope tints with her light and bloom the darkening scene. Then to ourselves we say, Come, bright imagination, come, relume thy orient lamp, with compensating ray shine on the mind, and pierce its gathering gloom with all the fires of intellectual day. End of Sonnet One. This recording is in the public domain. To Ruin by Robert Burns. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Rhonda Fetterman. To Ruin by Robert Burns. All hail, inexorable Lord, at whose destruction-breathing word the mightiest empires fall. Thy cruel, woe-delighted train, the ministers of grief and pain, a sullen welcome, all. With stern resolve, despairing eye, I see each aim dart, for one has cut my dearest tie, and quivers in my heart. Then lowering and pouring the storm no more I dread, Though thickening and blackening round my devoted head. And thou grim power, by life abhorred, While life a pleasure can afford, O oh, hear a wretch's prayer! No more I shrink appalled, afraid, I court, I beg thy friendly aid to close this scene of care. When shall my soul in silent peace resign life's joyless day? My weary heart its throbbing cease, cold mouldering in the clay. No fear more, no tear more, to stain my lifeless face, enclasped and grasped within thy cold embrace. End of To Ruin This recording is in the public domain. A Mathematical Problem in Verse by Benjamin Banneker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by David Fetterman A Mathematical Problem in Verse by Benjamin Banneker A Cooper and a Vinter sat down for a talk, both being so groggy that neither could walk. Says Cooper to Vinter, I'm the first of my trade. There's no kind of vessel but what I have made. And of any shape, sir, just what you will. And of any size, sir, from a ton to a gill. Then, says the Vinter, you're the man for me. Make me a vessel, if we can agree. The top and the bottom, diameter, define, to bear that proportion as fifteen to nine. Thirty-five inches are just what I crave. No more and no less, in the depth, will I have. Just thirty-nine gallons this vessel must hold. Then I will reward you with silver or gold. Give me your promise, my honest old friend. I'll make it tomorrow, that you may depend. So, the next day the cooper, his work to discharge, soon made the new vessel, but made it too large. 
he took out some stabs which made it too small, and then cursed the vessel, the vinter, and all. He beat on his breast, by the powers he swore, he never would work at his trade any more. Now, my worthy friend, find out, if you can, the vessel's dimensions, and comfort the man. End of a mathematical problem in verse. This recording is in the public domain. The Glove by Friedrich Schiller This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by David Fetterman The Glove by Friedrich Schiller Before his lion court, impatient for the sport, King Francis sat one day. The peers of his realm sat around, and, in balcony high from the ground, sat the ladies in beauteous array. And when with his finger he beckoned, the gate opened wide in a second, and in, with deliberate tread, enters a lion dread, and looks around, yet utters no sound. Then long he yawns and shakes his mane, and stretching each limb, down he lies again. Again, signs the king, the next gate open flies, and lo, with a wild spring, a tiger out hies. When the lion he sees, loudly roars he about, and a terrible circle his tail traces out. Protruding his tongue past the lion he walks, and snarling with rage around him warily stalks. Then, growling anew, on one side lies down too. Again, signs the king, and two gates open fly, and lo, with one spring, two leopards out high. On the tiger they rush, for the fight nothing loath. But he with his paws seizes hold of them both, and the lion with roaring gets up, and then all's still. The fierce beasts stalk around, madly thirsting to kill. From the balcony raised high above, a fair hand lets fall down a glove. Into the lists, where it is seen, the lion and tiger between. To the knight, sir, de Lorges, in tone of jest, then speaks young Cunigund fair. Sir knight, if the love that thou feel'st in thy breast is as warmed as thou art wont at each moment to swear, pick up, I pray thee, the glove that lies there. And the knight, in a moment with dauntless tread, jumps into the lists, nor seeks to linger, and from out of the mists of those monsters dread, picks up the glove with the daring finger. And the knights and the ladies of high degree, with wonder and horror, the action see, while he quietly brings in his hand the glove, the praise of his courage each mouth employs. Meanwhile, with a tender look of love, the promise to him of coming joys, fair Cunigund welcomes him back to his place, but he threw the glove point blank in her face. Lady, no thanks from thee I'll receive, and that self same hour he took his leave. End of the Glove. This recording is in the public domain. The Lamb by William Blake. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Carol Stripling. The Lamb by William Blake. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Gave thee life and bid thee feed By the stream and o'er the mead? Gave thee clothing of delight, Softest clothing woolly bright? Gave thee such a tender voice, Making all the vales rejoice? Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Little lamb, I'll tell thee, little lamb, I'll tell thee. He is called by thy name, for he calls himself a lamb. He is meek and he is mild, he became a little child. 
I a child, and thou a lamb. We are called by his name. Little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. End of the Lamb. This recording is in the public domain. Light Shining Out of Darkness by William Cowper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Carol Stripling. Light Shining Out of Darkness by William Cowper. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never-failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take! The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy, and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. End of Light Shining Out of Darkness This recording is in the public domain. Man Frail in God Eternal by Isaac Watts Read for LibriVox.org by T. Wellington Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Under the shadow of thy throne, thy saints have dwelt secure. Sufficient is thine arm alone, and our defense is sure. Before the hills in order stood, or earth received her frame, from everlasting thou art good, to endless years the same. Thy word commands our flesh to dust. Return, ye sons of men. All nations rose from earth at first, and turned to earth again. A thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening gone, short as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun. The busy tribes of flesh and blood, with all their lives and cares, are carried downward by thy flood, and lost in following years. Time, like an ever-rolling stream, bears all its sons away. Thy fly forgotten as a dream, dies at the opening day. Like flowery fields the nations stand, pleased with the morning light. The flowers beneath the mower's hand lie withering ere tis night. Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Be thou our guard while troubles last, and our eternal home. End a poem by Isaac Watts. This recording is in the public domain.